Welcome to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. The key to getting the most out of the seminar series is to listen to the small things, the subtle adjustments our faculty teams adhere to when the fishing might be tough or they're trying to target trophy game fish. That's what we call the gold nuggets of the seminar series. So come with me, let's get right to it and join, in progress, the Saltwater Sports and National Seminar Series. Coming to you from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, it's the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Now, here's George Poveromo. Welcome to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. A very exciting session coming up on trout. I have a softness in my heart on catching sea trout. I grew up fishing Miami's North Biscayne Bay for them and still try to do that at least a couple times a year. Very distinguished panel. And I'm gonna first start off with uh, Captain Debbie Hansen from the Fort Myers area. Uh, she does a lot of trout red fishing, shallow water inshore, has their own blog, shefishes2.com, so number two. Uh, from North Carolina, we have Captain Jod Owens who does a number, not only in uh, trout, but the larger trout. And Mike Goodwine out of the Tampa Bay area, probably the main person responsible for the decline of sea trout in that area because he catches them all. So, and we're gonna jump into this right now. And uh, you notice how I put the the, uh, the pretty anger closer to me because you two guys scare me. Just, I'm being honest with you right now. So, all right, jumping into sea trout and different types of bottom. Now you're from the Carolinas, you're from Southwest Florida, you're about maybe two hours north of Debbie there, Mike. What's the trout environment look in your area? Uh, our trout in Tampa, we look for anywhere between two to four feet of water. And you want healthy grass with giant sandy potholes with like sandy with some rocks in it. And um, inside the grass. So we'll get on the flat and the water clarity is awesome right now. And you just pull down inside of, on top of the grass. You could throw directly in the middle of the potholes or charm, we like the charm form. We'll throw some charm out and get them popping and they'll come right up to your, your boat like piranhas in town. Now, does the environment change? You know, we're talking about grasses and sand patches. Does the environment change throughout the Carolinas and your part of the world for trout? It, it does, George, and, and it, it's a, kind of like, a lot like redfish, uh, oyster rocks, finding those oyster cell rocks, but you always, always, always have moving water. I don't ever find trout in dead water areas. If, if, it, if you're going to find them on those main channels, a lot of times look for the uh, channels that go from the inlets to the ICW, those cut throughs, high flow areas. Water's moving very fast at falling tide, very fast on, on a rising tide. Those edges in the fall will hold a lot of trout. You have a lot of estuaries up in there too. So somebody's approaching one and here's a, a large outlet or it may be even a narrow one coming in. Uh, what's going to make one estuary or, or an outlet more productive than another. I mean, is there a way to really read that? Typically, you know, you're gonna find the tide's gonna be moving on a different side, depends on a rising tide and lower tide, how the water's falling or moving. I'm gonna fish the side of that channel or creek that has the most moving water. Gotcha, and what about your side? What, what are some of the subtleties uh, that you're looking for in terms of area that's gonna tell you, I'm gonna definitely have a good day catching trout here versus I need to keep moving and look for better water? Yeah, definitely. So some of the things we already mentioned, definitely I look for multiple different types of structure. So turtle grass, areas of turtle grass, I'm looking for oyster bars, but the main thing I'm looking for is a depth change. Any change in the bottom contour, trout really like to ambush from lower in the water column. So when I'm fishing, I do a lot of artificial fishing and I really want my baits to kind of hang in the middle of the water column a little bit. And I work them in the middle of the water column because those trout will ambush from below and hit those baits. So to me, depth change is key. Generally, I'm looking three to five feet of water right in that area, that type of depth change. It's intriguing because I, I grilled the three of you on the zones to find trout and all three of you emitted one, which has always been a good way to catch the larger trout. And that's fishing by docks and not just fishing by docks, but if you're in a somewhat shallow area, you look at the size of the boat that's up on the lift. If it's a large enough boat, you know that that boat, when it backs out with the props, it's, it's digging a little bit of a, a, a trench. When it comes back in, it's doing the same thing. When it gets really cold in the winter and all that grass is blown out under that boat and it's mud, that absorbs the sun and the heat a lot more. And a lot of times you could see these docks 
and pitch a live bait under a boat, knowing there's a little bit of a depression, and a lot of times you can pull some great trout out of there. Mike, you don't fish docks? Um, no, I try to stay away from docks, uh, especially in Tampa Bay. Every time I try to fish a dock, somebody called the police on me. I'm like, <laughs> I'm just trying to fish. So, but in, in Tampa, like especially right now during the wintertime, yeah. you hit on something about uh, all the trout will go into the rivers. They'll go deep uh -huh. into the rivers and that water is a little muddier in the, in the river. So when we have these negative tides, once that tide drop out, the sun will heat up that mud. Gotcha. And then once the water come in, all those trout will get right on top of that heated mud and the potholes in the river. And uh, the farther you go into the river, the more you'll catch trout in Tampa Bay. Very, very good. All right, we're going to take a commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the subtleties involved in working live baits versus artificial lures. And I want to get jot on working uh, popping corks, which is very, very important. But we'll take a break right now, and we'll come back in about two or three minutes with the resumption of the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, and we'll be discussing sea trout. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Simrad. Go with Simrad and go with confidence. And let the battle begin. Sirius XM Marine, weather, fish mapping, and entertainment for anglers. Mercury Outboards, go boldly. Angle, portable fridge freezers and high performance coolers. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. The discussion, the topic at hand, sea trout. Let's talk about some of the subtleties involved in using live bait versus artificials, and I'll kick it off. I love topwater trout fishing. To see a trout come up and bust a topwater is really, really remarkable. Uh, John, I want to talk to you. So many people fish a popping cork with a live shrimp. It could be a pinfish, it could be a soft plastic underneath it for trout. And I sort of led you in on this talking about the top water noise the trout get attracted to, they get attracted to the float. Now there are subtleties involved in working the float. Take me through the, the right subtleties and what you're trying to accomplish as it relates to trout. For me, it's going to be when I'm running a uh, rattle and popping cork, it's going to be during the shrimp season. For us, it's going to be sometime in October when the shrimp are moving and those trout are really keying in on shrimp because shrimp make that popping sound when they get, get And that's get, get what excited. you're trying to represent with that that style of float. Exactly. Short leader, 12 to 14 inches, what not very long. Test? Uh, 15 or 20 pound fluorocarbon. What size hook? Um, you, well, usually it's going to be a pre-rig shrimp okay. or I'm going to use a very light 16 ounce jig head because when you pop that thing and that shrimp falls slowly, the slower it falls, it's in the strike zone longer. We talk about that midwater stuff. Debbie was talking about that. It's very important. If it sinks down too fast, it doesn't look natural. They're going to hit it on the drop. So by going with a lighter lure under a pop and rattling cork, you will get more bites. You want that slower sink, what you're saying. All right, the subtleties. You said bang, bang, bang. I mean, is it a one pop, a two, or three pop? I, I, do, I do one or two. Rocks it low to the water so it really grabs that, that bobber. And, and, how, makes that loud and, and how long do you let it pause after you snap? I'll do pop, pop, and I will usually let it sit for about 10 seconds. So what will happen is, is that is it's sinking down, the shrimp is sinking down, or whatever lure you're using, the cork is on its side, yep. it'll right itself. When it gets tight, I let it for just a second, and then I do it again because they're usually going to hit it on the drop. If you let it sit there in the water after it's been sitting for a while, you're not going to get the bites because they really are going to hit it. 99% of the time while it's dropping. All right, shifting gears, artificials. Uh, are you, you, you prefer artificials, live bait, or what do you I do for your I love artificials, or, and I love top water for trout. Well, well tell Absolutely. us about it. Well, how are you selecting it? What are you rigging it to? And give me some of the subtleties of trying to get a trout to bite top water. Definitely, so low light conditions are key for me. I love fishing top water early in the morning, on cloudy days. And for me personally, I love using a darker profile bait, something that resembles a mullet that's got maybe a dark top um, just some dark on it so that in those low light conditions, those fish can really see that profile. And I'm walking the dog, so I basically, you know, tick tock, tick tock, a consistent, consistent, you can't break that cadence. Once you develop a, a cadence, you got to stick with it. And so, many so times... So you're talking when you're work, walking a dog, uh, by that you mean all the way back to the boat? You don't pause at all? You just keep that motion or... 
definitely keep the same cadence. And many times you'll see that trout will come up and it'll swipe at that lure and it'll miss it. The difference between a trout and a redfish, for example, is a redfish might come up and take one swipe at it and then he, you know, he's gone. A trout will continually try to attack that top water. So even if he misses it, just keep working it. Keep working it. Oh, uh, what pound test leaders that make a difference on, on, on plugs or? I'm, I'm using, I actually use 20 pound monofilament actually when I'm working top waters. The monofilament is more buoyant than fluorocarbon. Gotcha. Yeah, what I use. Instead of using a cork to make the sound like a shrimp and for you walking the dog, just put a lot of shrimp on there with a split shot, and that's, it'll do everything for you. It's got the noise, <laughs> and it's making the movement. It's making life easier. So I was wondering how long you're going to sit there and take the punishment of, uh, about the artificial lure talk. So now, Mike, spotlight's on you. We're going back to sea trout. You're live baiting. Are you doing anything special? Let's talk hook size, uh, 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 leader length. And what, how are you presenting the bait? Do you drift? Or tell, take us through the trout. So... Um, I use the same as I do for redfish, one out hook. Uh, I go down on my leader size to like 15 pound. Uh, mono, mono, of course. Mo which yeah, mono, or whichever one will sell that week. <laughs> why, why, why do you drop the leader size? Fuck up. Well, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so actually, if I could cast it a little farther, I'm going to use that. So anyway, because you want to make long cast when you're fishing for trout. All right. All right. So, and I use a, I take a, a split shot and put it probably seven inches up on the leader on the uh, the leader. Sure. And then cast it out there, and when that split shot hits the bottom, it'll kind of be like uh, what they call it, Carolina egging for bass fishing or whatever. Yeah. And that shrimp, you got that live shrimp. If you hook him through the horn, uh -huh. he'll do all the work for you. He'll walk the dog, he'll <laughs> dance or whatever you want to call it, and he's gonna make the sound so you don't need the cork. I like the free line. I only use corks. That's for people who's fishing for bluegills, <laughs> uh, you know, or people who don't know when they got a bite. So I free line everything I do. And I'm, I'm glad I'm an offshore anchor. I don't have to share the waters with MBB. Tough out yeah. there, you know, all there too. All right, we're going to pause for our sponsors now. And when we come back, I want to talk about catching the largest trout, the gator trout, because there's something special about catching these big fish that are really, really remarkable. So we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors, the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, the panel, Sea Trout. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Rapala, your best shot at a world record. Suffix, always use the best line. VMC, your expert in hooks. Williamson Lures, for the Pelagic Playground. Starbright, blending technology with performance since 1973. George will be right back. Welcome back to the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. We're talking sea trout with a distinguished panel of experts. Now let's circle back and talk about catching the largest trout of them all. And I know to try to get a four or five, six pounder on the top water is really sensational. I'm gonna come back to Mike. You're a live bait person. Uh, you know, some of my biggest trout I've taken on live pinfish. I've also taken them on top water. If you had a client that said, I wanna go target the bigger trout, mm -hmm. what are you gonna do differently to try to target the larger trout than say your normal school trout? All right, so first off, I find out where there's a bunch of smaller trout. You gotta have a bunch of smaller trout around to get the big trout, and I'll explain. So once I find the smaller trout, and we throwing out and we're hooking up one after the next, one after another, just every cast. And then I'll take a ladyfish, or I'll take a pinfish, and cut it as big as I can, slide it on there, and then I'll throw a rod away from where all the smaller trout are sitting. I put it on the outside. That bigger trout, nine times out of 10, is gonna be on, out on the outside waiting, because he can't move as fast, or he ain't gonna try to compete with all the smaller trout. So he'll just sit up there, sitting out there being lazy, and he'll sniff out that big piece of cut bait and eat it just like a redfish or snook or whatever else. A big trout will hammer a big piece of uh, cut bait, but you don't wanna toss it in the middle with all the, the tiny ones. You wanna get it off to the side, and he'll come over there and find it. Every Nine times out of 10, that's where the big ones are gonna be in Tampa. That, that, that's amazing, that, they call that chunking style for striped bass up in Jersey. Mm -hmm. You're soaking cut, 
bait on the bottom and, and you're picking off big trout that way. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yep. Uh, Debbie, if somebody wants you to go out and, and try to get a big trout, be it artificial lures or live bait, what are you gonna do differently? I'm still gonna go with my top water. Um, summer and fall, for me, would be the time that I would target them primarily because that's when most of our bigger bait fish are coming inshore into our estuaries. And low light conditions, for sure, that's definitely key. So you're either first thing in the morning, later in the evening. And I'm gonna work a little bit shallower. I'm actually gonna work probably right around a foot and a half to two feet of water up on our grass flats on those top waters. And those, those big gator trout are generally solitary. So as Mike said, they are gonna be away from the smaller trout, you know, that are maybe 18 to 20 inches in that range. Um, but they're gonna be off somewhere and current is key. So if there's current with an eddy, anywhere around those eddies where those trout can ambush those bait fish, that's definitely key as well. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear, stay cool and protected while fishing, Calcutta Outdoors, hardworking outdoor gear, JL Audio, ahead of the curve, ACR, building survival products since 1956, Florida Keys and Key West, visit flakeys.com. George will be right back. Welcome back to the final installment of the 34th Annual Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Question to you, Jock. We want to get some of the bigger ones. Number one, just like Debbie said, top water. So I'm okay. going to give you my number two. All right. Uh, and that's going to be larger, hard suspending baits. Uh, and the key is, 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 is not working it too fast. Really working it lure Give me an slow. example. Well, I'm going to throw across the current, all right on the edge of drop-offs and oyster lines where those fish are going to be on this, just on those drop-offs and eddies where that current's a little slower, but they can access the current. I'll be working those lures, throwing them out there, let them hit the water, and I'm going to let them sit for four or five seconds. I'm going to come tight with that line. I'm going to give them a sharp jerk, not a pull, a jerk. Let it sit. Mm -hmm. Let it sit, let it sit. Four or five, six seconds, jerk it again. And typically, right before you tell yourself it's time to jerk it, thump. Those big trout will hit that suspending twitch bait. So my transition would be early in the morning, we do top water. The sun starts to get up, the top water bite slows. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go to those baits that get just under the surface. And that's what makes a difference when they're a little, little, little worried about hitting the, you know, the top waters when it gets, uh, the sun gets high. But by getting under the surface a little bit, that's how I'll start to continue to get those bigger fish to bite when the sun gets up. Well, how, how big of a bait? You say you go to a bigger... Four, four to six inch hard baits. Yeah, so a, a real big one. It's kind of like what I was saying mm -hmm. with the cut bait. You put a big piece of bait, mm -hmm. the big trout like big bait. Yeah, it, it, it really does catch bigger fish by going to a bigger pattern bait. Very interesting. Mike, I have a question to you. You know, all the offshore panels and bottom fishing panels are discussing electronics. Now we're fishing trout. Very simple type of fishing in one aspect, and you're a Simrad Pro staffer. What about the side imaging that shoots out to the side? I, I know in a lot of cases we use it to try to catch live bait in a coastal waterway. Does side imaging have any uh, worthy of trying to find school trout or anything along those lines, and that's where you can broadcast and, and get a view both sides of your boat? Yes, like earlier when I said uh, about 40, 45 foot of water is where we get them, and uh, sometimes it sits for the water. And we got uh, in Tampa Bay, right off the flats, it's like these giant deep ponds. And uh, I've actually used my side imaging before to find the small ones, you know, and I'll see a, a group of them out to the left or to the right, hold down and start charming, and then chunk a big piece of bait off to the side to catch the big ones. George, something I use too, speaking of electronics, uh, Cirrus Marine Weather, the water temperatures in the colder winter times. Uh, most people use those, that water temperature stuff for offshore fishing, mm -hmm. but I actually use it for the trout and the surf line and around the inlets in this time of year, especially January, February, March. I can actually watch warmer pockets of water moving up and down the beach. And for us, it'll, all it takes is a degree maybe two degrees to turn on those bigger winter trout, especially on the inlets. And I've watched those patterns of warmer water just a degree or two move down the beach by using the Sears weather and, uh, and, and, and get a better bite. And one one day it's colder water. and a pocket will move in and the bite's a little bit better. And it's one of those things that used to be, I only used it for offshore fishing, but I'm actually watching, especially in the wintertime, looking for the just a little bit warmer water on the beach lines. Debbie, if you had to boil it down, uh, your three most important tips to catching more or larger sea trout, what would they be? Multiple types of structure, oyster bars, turtle grass, drop-offs. That, that, that's tip number one. Number two, 
just for me, I love using um, the Salty Ned rig, which is basically just a, a two and three quarter inch soft plastic that's rid to a one tenth ounce jig head. And that jig head, being that it's lighter, just, you know, a lot of people fish inshore and they're really reluctant to mix up the, the weights of their jig heads. They'll stick with a quarter ounce and that's the only size jig head or weight jig head that they'll use. But the lighter jig heads, especially to me during the winter months when we've got a lot of those you know, schools of trout in certain areas, really, really work well. And you can get into just one right after the other. Have a variety of jig heads available. Experiment with that because those jig heads are gonna have different um, fall rates in the water column and they're gonna give your baits different action. So experiment with different jig heads. And then again, you know, just focus on those lower light conditions, I think too, first thing in the morning, later in the evening. A lot of great information. I wanna thank Mike, Jot, and of course, uh, Debbie Hanson for that very informative session. It makes me wanna go out and catch sea trout. We'll be back with another exciting session of the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Hang in there. Well, there you have it. This week's Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Now adhering to Saltwater Sportsman Seminar Series tradition, you still have chances to win door prize drawings. Simply go to nationalseminarseries.com, log on to the door prize page, just give us your name, phone number, and an email address, and at the conclusion of the airing of the series in December, we will draw for a number of excellent door prizes. Get right to it. We'll see you on the next episode of the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series.